Hello, Chris here. Before we get underway, I just want to tell you about a podcast that is helping our society compare and contrast the ideas that matter most. Intelligence Squared US is a nonpartisan group restoring civility and respect to the public square through balanced, thoughtful, and intelligent debate. So stick around after this episode of the TED interview to hear a clip from the latest Intelligence Squared US podcast. It explores why debate is critical to the process of advancing ideas. Hello, hello. This is Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED interview. Now, my guest today is the Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudna, a biochemist at Berkeley University. She was one of a scientific duo who won the award last year for their development of the revolutionary gene editing tool known as CRISPR-Cas9, or CRISPR for short. This technology enables researchers to edit DNA with an unprecedented precision and ease, opening the door to really just a massive number of new possibilities for how we look after ourselves and how we interact with the living environment around us. In fact, it even enables us, in theory, to contemplate editing permanent changes into our DNA that could be inherited by future generations. This is so-called germline editing. That use of CRISPR, of course, raises many ethical issues, which Dr. Downer has been at the forefront of thinking about. So we discuss those, plus many of the truly remarkable possibilities that CRISPR is beginning to enable. Stand by for an exciting conversation here is Dr. Jennifer Dahodner. Okay, so here I am with Professor Jennifer Dahodner. Jennifer, welcome to the TED interview. Thanks so much for inviting me. Great to be here. So tell us what your big kind of aha moment was in, I guess, 2011, 2012 kind of time when you discovered, wow, that CRISPR wasn't just something that bacteria use for their own purposes. It's something that we could use to extraordinary effect. Describe what happened. Well, let me set the stage for that by pointing out that the research on CRISPR that, that my lab was doing, and effectively all of the handful of labs at the time that were working on CRISPR. It was not even a field that really, it was really just a, you know, kind of a curiosity in science. The focus of, of our work was to understand how bacteria fight viral infection, because that's the role of CRISPR in nature. It's a bacterial immune system. And importantly, like the human immune system, it's adaptive. So that means that it allows bacteria to acquire immunity to new viruses that they encounter in the environment. And how they do that is a very, very interesting process. And that's what we set out to investigate back in, actually really starting back in the mid 2000s. And then the work you're referring to was the result of a wonderful collaboration that we started with a French scientist, Emmanuel Charpentier back in 2011 to understand the function of a particular protein called CRISPR-Cas9. So the Cas9 protein is right at the heart of a bacterial immune system that her lab had come across in the process of studying certain kinds of bacteria that are infectious to people. So there was a, you know, kind of a medical uh, reason for studying these bacteria. And they use a type of CRISPR system that depends on the Cas9 protein and RNA molecules that guide Cas9 to particular kinds of DNA, namely viral DNA. And so our work with her lab was to understand that molecular process. So, you know, believe me, none of us at the time thought we were on the verge of, uh, of harnessing the system as a new technology. But what was quite extraordinary was that in the work that was done by two key members of our labs, Martin Yinek working in my lab at Berkeley and Chris Chylinski working in Emmanuel's lab in Vienna, is that as soon as we understood how Cas9 can find and cut viral DNA, and importantly, how it can find all kinds of different viruses because the bacterial cells program it 
to find new viruses as they show up. Once we understood that process at a molecular level, it was clear that this could be harnessed as a technology because of the way it works, the molecular sort of chemical basis for the way it works. And that really was that aha moment. And there really was a, you know, kind of a, uh, a moment where there was that understanding of the system for the first time and looking at each other in the lab and saying, holy smokes, this, this could be an amazing way to manipulate the code of life in cells because of the fundamental way that this system is able to recognize and cut DNA. Can you give us actually the quick um, summary of what CRISPR actually does, CRISPR-Cas9, what, what, what the technology does? I like to describe Cas9 itself as a molecular scissors or scalpel. It's, a, it's literally a, a, a chemical knife that cuts DNA. So you can think of the DNA double helix like a rope that contains that code of life. And what the CRISPR-Cas9 protein does with its RNA guide, that's very important to the way it works. That's the zip code that tells it where to go in the DNA. So people might recall that DNA has four letters in it and the letters are strung together in different orders that lead to, you know, they encode information necessary to make us. So CRISPR-Cas9 is able to cut that rope, that code of life, and importantly do it where it's told to cut. And the cutting itself doesn't make the change to the DNA sequence. What happens next is that in a cell, that cut DNA is repaired. And in the process of repair, the DNA sequence can be altered. And scientists can control how that repair happens so that we can either get a genetic disruption, so we can disrupt a gene so that a protein is no longer produced in the cell, for example, or the whole organism, or we can introduce an entire new section of genetic material at the position of the original cut so that we have new genetic information that goes into the cell that wasn't there before. And that's really what gives this tool its power, is that it's programmable. So a scientist can say, I want to find out what the function of the hemoglobin gene is. So I'm going to program Cas9 to go in there and disrupt it. Or you can say, I know that somebody has sickle cell anemia because they have a mutation in their hemoglobin gene, and I'm going to use CRISPR-Cas9 to fix it. And that's really what makes it an extraordinary tool for both research, but also for real application. I mean, people use the word processor analogy. Tell me if this if this still applies. But I mean, if the DNA is the sort of the book of an organism's life, CRISPR allows someone to go in and edit that book. And uh, basically, it's far cheaper than has ever been possible before to write a new paragraph, a new story, or any any number of new uh, plot twists, if you like, um, has not been possible before, and 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 now it's possible. So that it gives extraordinary power to shape the biology of every living thing. Frankly, I really like the book analogy, honestly, because I, I think it's it's quite accurate in the sense that CRISPR can literally be used to correct a single letter, a single typo in the code, if you will, or move a word around or remove or change a sentence, a paragraph, or a whole page or a whole chapter. So it's it's really quite extraordinary that way. So I would love you to talk about how this technology has been used. What, what has excited you so far in terms of the applications? Because there are so many. Describe some. You know, it, it was clear pretty fast, pretty quickly, that the CRISPR technology would be really useful and that labs were quickly adapting it to do all kinds of experimentation in, in a wide range of different systems. And amazingly, I don't, probably most people don't know this, but one of the labs that adopted it early on, Keith Young at Harvard Mass General Hospital, they actually had within you know, a few months of our, our publication, they had actually shown that you could already change the DNA in whole organisms. They were doing it in zebrafish. So they were you know, using fish embryos and treating with CRISPR to make changes to genes that then became part of the, you know, the entire fish and then could be passed on to future generations. And so that was already a demonstration that you know, this technology was going to be 
exceptionally useful for manipulating not just cells and growing in a dish in the lab or a piece of DNA in a test tube, but for changing the DNA of entire organisms in ways that allowed it to be those new traits to be inherited. On the research side, I can't stress enough how exciting it has been over the last not quite 10 years to see the research coming out of different labs around the world that are using CRISPR to address questions in biology that, frankly, in the past either couldn't be asked at all, or if they could, it would be very, very difficult. You didn't really have the tools to address them. And a couple of examples I love, one is understanding the genetics of butterfly wing patterns. So a number of labs have been able to use CRISPR in butterflies to change the genes and first of all, figure out which genes are responsible for creating the beautiful wing patterns on say a monarch butterfly and then being able to change them and manipulate them. And why would you wanna do this? Well, it's part of the you know, fundamental question about developmental biology. How do sets of genes develop in an organism like a butterfly to talk to each other and create these kinds of complex patterns that we observe on the body? And so that's something that, you know, in the past, scientists could observe those patterns. They might occasionally find animals in nature that had changes to the patterns due to random mutations, but they couldn't actually do experimentation. And that's where CRISPR comes in. It, it, it's helping us get to the point where we actually understand the mechanism, where you can associate right. a specific genetic sequence with a specific developmental outcome. Right. and. You, you know, uh, so that that is a whole different level of understanding than just the sort of the vague association of probably this gene has something to do with this piece. Right. And, and to, you know, in the past, that was possible, but only in a very small subset of organisms that had been carefully cultivated in the laboratory to be, you know, genetically manipulable. So there are certain, like, for example, little tiny worms have been the subject of research for a long time. Yeast has been the subject of research for a long time, fruit flies. And these organisms are studied largely because they can be genetically manipulated to do the kind of thing you just mentioned so that we can, you know, ascribe particular functions to genes or sets of genes. But, you know, for the vast majority of organisms, including us humans, <laughs> uh, we can't really do that. And so that's really where CRISPR has been very enabling. It just suddenly opens the door to that kind of genetic understanding in effectively any organism that has DNA. I mean, all organisms have DNA. So we have a tool now that allows us to do that kind of manipulation that answers those fundamental questions in, in any system. And have there been instances, speaking of us, where people have been able to use CRISPR to eliminate problematic genetic defects that cause terrible diseases, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think sickle cell disease is a wonderful example of that. I think about 30 people now have been treated in clinical trials so far with CRISPR for their sickle cell disease. And the results have been exceptional. I mean, they've been really exciting to see that you know people are effectively cured of this genetic disease that in the past could you know, be managed at best, but certainly not cured. And I think that's really a an exciting, you know, harbinger of what's on the horizon for other diseases as well in the future, having a tool that allows us to do that kind of corrective manipulation to DNA. And actually my son, uh, just this morning, my son said, hey, mom, I, I was listening to NPR this morning and they were talking about a CRISPR trial for a genetic eye disease hmm. where two people have now been treated with CRISPR and we don't know the results yet because they, they've just started the trial. But the hope is that, again, CRISPR will be able to correct a disease causing mutation that in that case causes a genetic form of blindness and give those people back their eyesight. It'd be amazing. But those, those are interventions in an adult that's basically intervening where their DNA is operating and, and replacing the sort of the mutated part of the DNA with so, so that it operates as it healthily. Is there a possibility and how dangerous is it to go the next step and to edit uh, germline DNA so that you avoid, uh, I mean, you know, in, in principle, it's possible to imagine getting rid of certain genetic mutations altogether? Right. It's an extraordinary thing to contemplate, isn't it? Thinking about, you know, getting rid of a disease-causing mutation at the source. 
and maybe doing it before someone ever has to suffer from the effects of the disease at all. And the, uh, you know, I think that that opportunity for what we call germline editing, so that's editing in DNA that becomes part of the entire individual and can be passed on to future generations is on the one hand, just an extraordinary thing to contemplate. On the other hand, it comes along with enormous biological and ethical and societal challenges and risks that I think have to be carefully managed. And so what what do we do about this tool? It's very enabling, but it's also got this extraordinary risk associated with it. Didn't you early on um, propose a moratorium on germline research, essentially, that so that we could just take time to figure out whether we really wanted to do this. Um, what is the status of that moratorium at this point? Well, going back to 2015, so in the beginning of, that, or actually a little even earlier than that, you know, in 2014, I started to realize, as I think a few others in the field were, were recognizing at the time, that the, you know, the technology was moving ahead at lightning speed. And I didn't see any reason why it wouldn't work in human embryos. And yet, at the time, government agencies, you know, uh, regulatory groups were largely completely unaware of the technology. It was just so, so new. So what do we do? You know, you've got this incredible tool, and you know that it has this potential, and that potential could harm people, it could harm the whole field if it you know, were used inappropriately. So what I did in in early 2015 was with the Innovative Genomics Institute that I had started uh, the previous year in 2014 at at UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco. We got a group together of just under, I think it was around 20 scientists who got together to tackle that topic. And we had a, a pretty intense kind of workshop on this. And that led to publication of an article in a scientific journal a little later that spring in which we argued that the kind of manipulation of the human germline that we're discussing that would lead to heritable changes should not happen right now. So we didn't use the word moratorium, uh, partly because I, I don't, I think it's, a, you know, it implies that, that you have some mechanism of, of enforcement, which we didn't. But we were certainly calling for the scientific community to get behind this idea and importantly, to start discussing it more broadly and really encourage transparency. Who might be considering doing this type of work and for what reason? And we should you know, have an open conversation about it. And the good news is that that has led to a, a large um, effort globally to talk about the, the application of CRISPR in the human germline. There now have been two international summits on the topic and a third one that is planned to happen in London next year as well as a large number of reports that have been issued about this. And, and I think the right now the consensus is exactly what you just said, basically that you know there shouldn't be uh, a rush to use this in the human germline, at least certainly not for clinical use, until we better understand the technology and frankly have a chance to better evaluate when and, and whether it should ever be used in that context where it would cause more benefit than harm. Does that create a dynamic, though, where some scientists, in, perhaps in parts of the world, that have less at stake from whatever opprobrium could, could fall upon them to, to get a lead, to get ahead, you know, to make history? And um, so, I mean, that there have been experiments done with CRISPR on human embryos, I think, in China and elsewhere, perhaps. What, what's your view of what's happened? I think one of the most shocking emails I ever received was uh, one that had the subject line, uh, babies born. And and I received that in November of 2018. It was a note from, it was a short note from a Chinese scientist, uh, He Zhengkui, who was letting me know that he had used CRISPR in human embryos, not just for research, but had actually implanted those edited embryos. And the babies had been born, and um, it was, uh, you know, quite a quite a shocking uh, announcement at the time, and kind of still is. But you know, it, it was happening at, a, at an interesting moment because I was just about to depart for the second international summit on human germline editing, which was happening in Hong Kong, 
So I went off to the meeting and the uh, scientist came and he presented his, his work. And I think what, what happened next was really quite, quite interesting because many people at the conference and who heard about the work in other ways and in the media recognized, and I think rightly, that what was done was truly unethical and that, that it, there really was no medical reason to do that kind of work, that, it, that really probably the motivation was more about being first or, you know, yeah, gathering recognition for the work rather than thinking about what's going to be best for these parents that are giving birth to these kids. And so the, I think as a result of that, there really was quite a strong international backlash or kind of, you know, pushback against the rush into uh, the, cl for the clinical use of human germline editing, such that we haven't really seen that work progressing in the you know years since. Now that doesn't mean it's not happening, and there's certainly some work going on to research how CRISPR works in human embryos. But that's a far cry from using it clinically to edit uh, actual people. So um, you know I think there's still an opportunity right now that I, I I'm hopeful will be embraced to encourage transparency and the kind of contemplation and, and real reflection that I think needs to happen before rushing to for that kind of use. Was he using CRISPR to remove uh, a dangerous gene or just more sort of random, just a sort of proof of principle? Uh, no, it wasn't random. No, the, the stated purpose was to alter a gene that encodes one of the proteins required for T cells, which are part of the immune system, to be infected by the HIV virus. So the stated purpose was to protect these kids uh, who resulted from, from this work from a future infection by HIV. Are the kids healthy, to your knowledge, so far? Well, yeah, that's a great question that I certainly don't know the answer to. It's not been made public, so I don't know who may be monitoring their health and, you know, how that will be handled going forward. It's a, clearly a big challenge. Yeah. And there'll almost be pressure, like if this was, you know, a scientific experiment for the long term to almost expose them at some point to HIV to see if the genetic engineering worked. <laughs> it's, a, it's a chilling thought in itself. It's in a, a chilling a thought, yeah. right, right. I mean, that kind of you know, that to me, what was so shocking about that work when it was first announced is that it really harked back to experimentation on humans that was done, you know, for example, during the Second World War that put people at risk kind of needlessly. And yet, and yet, there are countless parents out there who are desperate to have kids and who know that they carry genes that have a real risk of sentencing their kids to short lives or painful lives or some such, couldn't you argue that actually there's a, there's a moral responsibility to figure out how to use this technology wisely and to, you know, like if it, if it genuinely is possible to remove something that is damaging, something that was in the first place a mutation, why, why wouldn't we do that? Definitely. And, and that was, that was, uh, I, I still remember that, um, actually that exact topic coming up at the first meeting we held on the subject back in early 2015, where, you know, kind of, you could kind of imagine a conference table, you've got 20 scientists and clinicians kind of, you know, debating this issue of, you know, should we or shouldn't we in the human germline with CRISPR? And suddenly somebody sat back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe we're thinking about this all wrong. You know, maybe at some point we're going to, be sitting here considering it unethical not to use it in that way, right? For the kind of purpose that you just said. Suppose that a family has a genetic disease that's been passed on to generation to generation.
solution, there's no way to deal with it. Um, maybe it would be far more ethical to, you know, get rid of the offending gene than to allow people to, to suffer from this disease. And, um, you know, I think that's a really, really important point. So the question is, you know, how do you decide when to do that? Uh, how do you man ensure the technology is safe for that kind of application? These are, you know, these are tall, tall orders and they have to, you know, there, there has to be sort of a hand in hand, you know, doing the appropriate research, but also I feel really thinking hard about, you know, what are the ethical and societal implications? You also, I think you also have to think about equity, right? Equitable access. Indeed. But how, how much progress has been made on those ethical questions? I mean, is there a kind of a roadmap in view that t in your mind sort of strikes the right balance between what is possible and, you know, what is, what is wise? You're finding that balance between kind of courageously doing <laughs> good for people who who are desperate for that help while avoiding triggering some kind of worse unintended consequence yeah um well i i, I think uh you know we're very much i would say midstream in that in that consideration and that kind of global conversation it's a subject that has attracted a lot of attention and i think rightfully so i think it's also important to point out that lest folks that are listening think that this is the primary use of CRISPR, it's actually not, you know. So right now, the vast majority of work that's going on clinically, certainly with CRISPR, is about using it in ways that affect an individual, but not anybody else that doesn't create heritable changes. So uh, that's something very important to appreciate. And I, I personally think that that at least for the foreseeable future, will continue to be true with CRISPR. That'll be the primary type of disease that will be impacted by this technology. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be aware that, you know, there is this other mode of use and that, you know, there may be certain circumstances where in the future it becomes appropriate to use it that way. I'd love to come on to some of those other uses, but but just before we go there, just to finish off on this point, it does seem almost like a common track of many technologies that they move from, you know, that, that there's an astonishing discovery and then there's a sort of shock at what might be possible and people get creeped out. But then as people get more comfortable with it, th there is almost a shift of responsibility to, no, we actually would, we would be at fault not to use this. There's a uh, Stuart Brand um, has a famous quote where he says, you know, we are as gods and may as well get good at it. I mean, he was looking at it more, I think, from almost from an environmental point of view and so forth, that, that you know, humans dominate the planet. So we have no choice other than to try to make responsible decisions proactively about how to use that power wisely. And um, I mean, it, it, seem, it seems possible that, that something similar will happen in this case, that as and in fact, it may go quite beyond the issues of just germline editing to avoid terrible genetic diseases to enhancement. You know, I mean, it's like it, in, in one way, if you had the choice to bring someone into the world who was harder working and wiser and less likely to be violent, wouldn't you have a moral responsibility to do that if you knew you could? Do you do you ever wake up in the night, Jennifer, sweating at what you've unleashed on the world here? <laughs> well, actually, as you were asking the question, I was thinking back to the um, early days of in vitro fertilization. Mm. I think that's an interesting technology to compare with CRISPR in a way because it started as, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember my parents talking about test tube babies and, you know, was it right, you know, was it right for babies to be conceived in a test tube that seemed very strange to them and maybe kind of wrong somehow. And then, you know, and that kind of being discussed around the dinner table. And then, you know, we had family friends who ended up having a, a child uh, with in vitro fertilization that, you know, gave them a, a wonderful addition to their family. And that happened more and more. And I think that happened, you know, across the, the globe, really. And so I think for many people that might have initially thought, you know, this seems odd, or maybe like, some kind of artificial manipulation of human reproduction that maybe isn't quite right to it being now widely accepted. And, you know, many people use this to start their families or to expand their families. Um, I wonder if a similar thing will happen with CRISPR in the future, where eventually it becomes 
acceptable, widely acceptable, perhaps, to use it in at least for certain kinds of genetic manipulations that lead to enhanced health. And then the question is, you know, uh, you know, all those complicated questions about like, you know, when do you do it? And when is the benefit greater than the risk? And, um, and then who decides and should it be regulated and who pays for it? And, you know, all of those kinds of accessory questions. We might need a different term than genetic manipulation. It might, might need to be um, genetic recovery or <laughs> genetic creativity or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, or, but or anyway. enhancing genetic health or, you know, something like that, right? Let's move back to the topic of therapeutics for, you know, like how can CRISPR help me in five to 10 years time? What's, what are some of the possibilities that you see coming that you're excited by? I guess I would put it in, uh, I, there are a couple of buckets that we could, you know, consider. One is for genetic disease that is clearly, you know, I think where everyone would clearly classify the condition as a disease, sickle cell disease, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease. These are all examples where there's a well-known um, genetic basis for those diseases. And in those examples, a single gene that goes awry that is kind of the causative agent of that disease. And I think those are all examples where in the next couple of decades, we can absolutely imagine CRISPR-based cures that will be coming online. You know, that's all there's, you know, as we discussed, it's already happening for sickle cell disease. It's not that far off for muscular dystrophy, and then maybe a little bit further down the line for cystic fibrosis and Huntington's. But, you know, these are all areas that where there's a lot of very active work going on, both on the research side, but also, frankly, on the real clinical, you know, practical clinical application of CRISPR in those areas. So that's one category. But, you know, you might say, well, fortunately, I don't have those particular diseases. So is it going to still have an impact on me? And I would argue that certainly over the next couple of decades, the answer is probably yes. And the reason is that I think that increasingly it will be possible to manipulate genes in any of us to what I, what I like to call it is enhance our health span. So enhance our, our healthy life that we have um, through some genetic tweaks. For example, it's already well appreciated that there's a, a gene in our cells that controls cholesterol levels. And there are a few natural individuals in the human population that naturally have an alteration in that gene that allows them to dine on whatever they want and, you know, they're never going to have to take Lipitor, right? So they basically have really low cholesterol that's kind of genetically indicated. Imagine that we could give everybody that gene, you know, and, and uh, use CRISPR to do it. You could protect people very broadly from cardiovascular disease without requiring chronic use of a, of a drug. You know, it might ultimately be less expensive to do it that way and perhaps safer. So that's one example and, and there are others, you know. So I think, I think that in the next couple of decades, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility at all. And can you just help my mental model for how that actually happens? Like it's easier to imagine if you edit an embryo cell, how, how like a, a, a body can grow up where every cell then has that in its DNA. But I'm already here and I've got trillions or of, of, of cells, I think it is. Um, all with the wrong DNA in them. <laughs> can, can, can CRISPR actually live edit in a living adult like m millions and millions of different cells enough to affect the kind of biological impact that that revised DNA would need to actually change our biology? Ah, yes. Great question. So one of the things that's very interesting about CRISPR is that we're already learning in various animal models of genetic disease that in many cases, first of all, it's not necessary to edit the DNA of every cell in the animal to have a therapeutic benefit. In fact, 
in many cases, you only need to edit, you know, a small fraction of the cells. And secondly, in many cases, you only need to edit cells in one kind of tissue. So you might need not need to get to every cell in the body. Maybe you only need to get to the liver or the brain or the heart or the muscle. And so there, you know, uh, it's, it's already possible to do the kind of CRISPR mediated manipulation, again, in animal models that has a therapeutic benefit. A lot of times the editing is done in cells that are uh, progenerative, you know, they're, we call them stem cells, they're cells that have the ability once they get going to differentiate into a, uh, a liver cell or some other tissue type. And so if CRISPR is used to edit those types of, of stem cells, then they can actually provide enough edited cells in, as those cells uh, start to grow and divide to provide a therapeutic benefit. So um, beyond human therapeutics like that, there are other ways that we could get benefit from the foods we eat, I think. Talk about that. Great. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, the focus on clinical use of CRISPR, while really important, honestly, is probably not the way that many of us will first interact with, you know, CRISPR edited organisms, because I think it's more likely that many of us will, in the not too distant future, be eating food that is uh, produced either uh, directly or indirectly benefiting from CRISPR editing. So how, you know, how, how is that going to work? Well, it's already, CRISPR is already being used to give crops the kinds of traits that will protect them from drought, as well as um, allow them to grow with less use of chemical fertilizers, which could be very helpful in terms of thinking about climate change and making those uh, plants more accessible to farmers in various parts of the world. But it's also possible to use CRISPR to do things like increase the yield of crops and increase the nutritional value of crops. And so that's something that I think is, um, you know, it, it's, it's coming. And, and to me, the question there is not so much, can that be done technically? The answer is it can, but will people be receptive to those types of um, of crops. Well, yeah. well that, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Yeah. I mean, people, a lot of people are upset at the idea of GMO foods. Um, is CRISPR just a way of doing G GMO more cost-effectively, more cheaply? And therefore, it's actually a bad thing because everything will now be artificially edited. Well, I like to point out that everything we eat is, I would claim, is uh, a GMO in the sense that humans have been breeding crops for millennia. And how do they do that? Well, currently plant breeders introduce random mutations into DNA, random, randomly. They don't know where they are or what they are. And then they select for those crops that have desired traits. Of course, that brings along all kinds of other changes to the DNA that you know are not mapped and we don't know what they are. That's uh, one of the reasons why we have tomatoes that last a long time on the grocery shelf but don't taste very good, or we have roses that are uh, thornless but they also lost their smell, you know, things like that, right? And so imagine that, you know, with CRISPR, we have now a scalpel, right? We have a precision tool that gives plant breeders for the first time a way to manipulate just the gene or genes that they know are responsible for a particular trait and nothing else. So I would argue that it's actually safer in a way to do that because we're not dragging along lots of other random changes and it's much more likely that we'll, we will end up with the um, desired traits and we won't have lost or gained other traits that are undesirable in the process. You think you could use CRISPR to make unmushy tomatoes and apples? I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how high a percentage of the food we eat is kind of less than optimal. I mean, it's, it seems to be bred yeah. for, basically, it's got to cost almost nothing and look pretty in a supermarket. If it tastes right. terrible, that's no problem. That's no problem, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I'd, lo I'd love to change that. <laughs> What, what, what other possibilities are there about how this technology could be used? 
people are, are already excited about ways that it will impact the environment. So as you know, there's you know lots of, of work booting up right now around climate change. And I'm quite excited that you know we have a couple of big initiatives going on at the Innovative Genomics Institute that are just kicking off that involve manipulating uh, soil organisms in ways that will allow them to capture more carbon, sort of store more carbon, as well as to interact better with plants and again, help with this challenge of you know, giving plants sufficient nutrition without uh, requiring farmers to add a lot of you know, exogenous chemical uh, fertilizers. So I think that's an area that's uh, you know, kind of really interesting. Um, there's also quite a bit of interest in um, using it in the control of insects that can spread disease. And so there's, and again, this has been in the media a bit because of the, you know, there is some inherent risk that goes along with it. But one of the, uh, one of the, I think, very interesting possibilities about CRISPR is that it could in principle be used to control mosquito populations that are responsible for spreading malaria, which is a huge global scourge that, you know, could be potentially addressed by controlling the vector that spreads the disease. There's a TED speaker, Rob Reed, who painted a scenario um, in a recent TED talk and also in a recent podcast um, about the potential for a lone, crazy character, possibly even like a high school student. It's not unimaginable that within a few years, a high school student will have the tools to edit a virus, for example, and um, CRISPR has made it very, very easy. And there, and and you know, you could imagine that high school labs will have have the sort of technology to do this. I mean, we've seen what a single rogue pathogen can do, a single rogue virus can do. If you if you you know, putting together the pieces of a sort of depressed, crazy teenager who wants to bring the world down, with the power that we will have now. I mean, it's. Could, could you argue that it makes anything that's gone before less scary by comparison? I mean, a teenager can't build a nuclear bomb, but aren't we getting quite close to a world where a single rogue individual could unleash something horrifying on humanity? Do you worry about that? Well, I worry about it less with CRISPR and more with computers, I have to say. I mean, you know, a single rogue individual, uh, probably a high school student, could shut down an oil pipeline, for example, or, you know, break into government computers, et cetera, shut down a bank. I think, I think that's, uh, you know, we've already seen uh, examples of this kind of thing going on. So if I worry about, about uh, rogue individuals, I tend to worry about it more in, in the electronic and computing realm than I do with CRISPR, I have to say. I mean, it's amazing to imagine a future sort of 30 to 50 years from now where, where, where these kind of crazy arms races almost between people trying to keep control of a chaotic world and, um, you know, you, you could picture a sci-fi plot where scientists are desperately trying to use CRISPR and other technologies to eliminate the genocidal tendencies of certain human beings um, so that the power that we have given them won't actually be used to, to, to take us all down. Um, it's um, just, just the notion of being able to edit who we are. It's a game changer, Jennifer. You have changed the game. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, I, I get excited by possibility like this, but I kind of also understand why some people are creeped out a bit by, by the future that is coming our way. Well, it's, do it's have, kind do, of do, do, awesome do, do, in all meaning <laughs> of that word, right? <laughs> you find a way of staying um, optimistic and excited about, about uh, the potential here? I have to say that right now I'm I'm spending the vast majority of my effort on making sure that CRISPR becomes available and useful and affordable to people that can benefit from it. And you know, like I said, we're focused at our institute on both clinical applications as well as um, uh, ways to mitigate climate change. And I think these are two areas where. There's tremendous positive potential for CRISPR if, you know, it becomes a technology that is widely available and safe and, and effective at what it needs to get done. And that's really where I do a lot of my work currently in terms of both, you know, philanthropic fundraising, but also kind of guiding a large team of scientists in their efforts. And that gives me hope for the future. It does. <laughs> 
So Ted's all about ideas worth spreading. If you could um, inject an idea into the minds of everyone listening, one idea uh, around this, what would that idea be? Oh boy, what would that one idea be? I think it would be that the you know the CRISPR technology is going to increasingly be woven into the fabric of our lives, not necessarily our own DNA being manipulated with it, but we will find that it's being used to develop new therapies, to um, understand genetics in new ways, and to manipulate the environment that we live in in positive ways. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of person. You have to understand I'm a real optimist here, but I also am a realist in the sense that we have to stay on top of it. It's a powerful tool, a wonderful technology, but it comes along with extraordinary responsibility. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's, it's not every day I get to talk to a woman who's won a Nobel prize. Uh, there aren't that many of you. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Uh, we need more, <laughs> and um, r- really, really, you've you, you've changed the world, and it, and it's been exciting to hear from you directly. So, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much for hosting me. Really interesting conversation. Okay, that was Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Now then, I always enjoy hearing what you think. So, if you have any feedback at all on the show please write to me directly at tedchris at ted.com. So that's T-E-D-C-H-R-I-S at ted.com. I read every one of those emails. The TED interview is part of the TED Audio Collective, a collection of podcasts dedicated to sparking curiosity and sharing ideas that matter. The show is produced by Kim nadefain Peterson and edited by Grace Rubenstein and Sheila Orfano. Our mixer is Sam Baer, fact checkers by Charles Wallace and Julia Dickerson, and special thanks to Michelle Quint, Colin Helms, Nicole Bodie, and Anna Phelan. And a special thanks to you for listening. Okay, here's that clip from Intelligence Squared US that I mentioned earlier. The art of thoughtful disagreement is the key to being able to share our ideas and consider new solutions. So give Intelligence Squared US a listen. It's a podcast I highly recommend. I just want to be right. It doesn't have to come from me. And how stupid is it to not be flexible? It's just so dumb. And it's, but it's that people form conclusions and they're attached to the conclusions rather than working themselves to the right answer. After all, if there's a disagreement, how do you know that the wrong person isn't you rather than the other person? And so the art of thoughtful disagreement, to be able to consider the other side, of course, is a f- essential step toward getting to the right answer. Pain plus reflection equals progress. So... um If one can calm oneself down when one gets bad outcomes and own those bad outcomes and then realize that there might be things that open-mindedness could bring, that would be good.